of the defining characteristics of birds, some of the things, unique adaptations they have. We'll talk about some examples, a little bit about the evolution. And then we're going to spend some time talking about um, bird eggs and what is an egg and how does the, the chick develop inside um, and so forth. So first off, birds um, are vertebrates. They evolved from reptiles. We'll talk in a couple minutes about how we know that. Um, but they evolved basically from dinosaurs. That's where, where birds evolved from. And nobody said it because I think you knew I was, I was, uh, I said characteristic of all birds. But nobody said flight is a characteristic. Although the majority of birds are capable of flight. There are flightless birds. Um, but many of the characteristics that birds have are adaptations to flight. Because um, being able to fly requires um, a bunch of different uh, physiological and anatomical adaptations to make that possible. And one important thing that somebody mentioned earlier is the bone structure. So the lighter an animal is, the easier it is to fly, the less energy it requires. So birds have some adaptations that help them to be light um, in comparison to other animals of a similar size. One of those is their bone structure. They have sort of hollow bones that are very lightweight. When I was in, in college, I took a class. It was, again, a full class only about birds, called ornithology. And um, in that class, you got to pick up um, a bird skeleton and it is very, very light compared to what you would think. You pick it up and you thought it would be much heavier than it is. And so the bones of a bird have a much lower density than the bones of a mammal, for example. They have, they're strong still, they have to be strong, but inside they have a whole bunch of sort of air pockets with strands of bone tissue sort of crisscrossing to, to give them strength. Um, but there's a lot of space in there. There's a lot of air space. And that makes them very lightweight. and makes it easier for them to fly. So their bones are sort of unique. As far as reproduction, somebody mentioned that earlier as well. Birds do have internal fertilization. So birds have a variety of mating behaviors in which the male um, and the female mate. The male deposits sperm inside of the female um, bird's reproductive tract, where those sperm cells are then fertilized as egg cells. Then, though, after that fertilization takes place, the rest of the, what we would call an egg, um, forms afterwards. After fertilization takes place, the yolk forms and the shell and so forth. Um, and then birds have external development. The young, the embryo, grows outside of the body <coughs> in the egg. Um, and generally, they have to be incubated. Birds are the first group that we've talked about in which they are warm blooded. Do um, you have a question? We'll go over that. We're going to get there. So uh, I'll answer that question in a minute. Um, so fish, amphibians, reptiles, all were cold-blooded. Their body temperature was dependent on their surroundings, um, which meant um, they can't regulate their body temperature internally. Birds are the first group that had um, the ability to regulate and maintain a constant body temperature. And so they're warm blooded. And you can think of this in terms of evolution, it does have some advantages, but it also has some disadvantages. Does anyone know an advantage of warm, being warm blooded? Courtney? Being able to um, fly around. Okay. When? So being able to fly around, I mean, but. They can also be active at what time? They can maintain their body heat. Yeah, they can. That's sort of the definition, Olivia. Like, I don't know. I was going to say like hibernation. Like You're getting there. Because
because yesterday I was shoveling my driveway for the third time, and the only animals that I saw were some birds and a few squirrels. I didn't see any frogs hopping across the street. There were no turtles in my backyard. Okay, so. <coughs> yeah, they can because they're maintaining a higher body temperature. They can be active regardless of how cold it is outside. Okay. So right now, all cold-blooded animals are in a period of dormancy, of hibernation, just sort of doing nothing. Whereas birds and mammals are keeping a higher body temperature, and they're able to be active even if it's cold out. Um, so that's an advantage. They can live in a wider variety of climates. Birds live in all seven continents. Some birds migrate all the way to Antarctica. Um, and so they can live in those very, very cold conditions because they are able to create and maintain um, a high body temperature. What's, what, what's the downside of that? What's the disadvantage of being warm blooded? Ashley? It takes a lot of energy. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to keep that elevated body temperature. And so, therefore, warm-blooded animals have to eat a lot more. They need a constant source of energy. Anyone have a pet bird at home? No. Well, if you did, if you know somebody that does, you know they have to feed it up every day. They have to keep their tray of food full. Just like feeding, if you have a pet mammal, like a dog or a cat, you have to feed it every single day. Versus a cold-blooded pet, a turtle, a snake, a lizard, um, where you don't have to feed it very often because they don't require as much energy. So being warm-blooded is helpful, and you can live in a wider variety of climates, you can be active throughout the year, but at the same time requires a lot of energy. Anna, what was your question here? Except for the cold-blooded animals in the uh, summer, do they get hot? They do, but they have certain behavioral adaptations where they'll you know, go in the shade, go in the water, so that they don't get heated up too much. So they're warm-blooded. As far as their circulation, remember when we talked about fish, they had two chambered hearts. Amphibians had three chambered hearts. Reptiles had three and a half. Well, birds have evolved a full four chambered heart. <coughs> and this is important adaptation. The act of flight requires tremendous amount of energy. It also requires a lot of oxygen. Those muscles to work and keep a bird flying requires a lot of energy, a lot of oxygen. And having a four-chambered heart allows for the most efficient delivery of oxygen to the body <coughs> cells because there is no mixing of blood that is high in oxygen with blood that's low in oxygen. Because the oxygenated deoxygenated blood is kept completely separate. There's sort of two circuits of circulation in this four-chambered heart gets the maximum amount of oxygen to the cells. And this is because in a four-chambered heart, okay, the blood that has been depleted of oxygen, blood that's given up its oxygen to all the cells of the body, that, when it gets pumped out of the heart, on the right side of the heart, it gets pumped directly to where it needs to go, which is where? This low oxygen blood, where does it need to get to? Jonathan? It needs to get to the lungs. And so the right side of the heart pumps that blood to the lungs. And in the lungs, it gets sort of recharged. It gets new oxygen. And when it returns to the heart, though, it returns to the other side of the heart, the left side of the heart. That blood that's now rich in oxygen can be pumped out and go to all the various parts of the body to deliver that oxygen. And then when it comes back to the heart, it comes on this side and goes back to the lungs. And so you have this circulation which gets the max amount of oxygen at all times to all the bodies. Um, and it depends on, on the animal and its size and heart rate. We're going to talk a lot about eggs. Question? Morgan? Does your body like, make blood? Yep. Constantly 
making blood cells, and, and old blood cells are, are being destroyed. Yeah. Joey? Ashley? Not have enough oxygen? Yeah. Um, I mean, if you don't have enough oxygen, like, for example, if you hold your breath, and your body starts using up the oxygen in your cells, then eventually you can pass out, lose consciousness. Um, also, you need to get rid of the carbon dioxide in your blood by exhaling. So it's another fact that if you're not breathing, you're not able to get rid of that carbon dioxide. Olivia? Like, are cold-blooded animals, like, not supposed to eat every day, like, They can. I mean, they just don't need to like that. Um, so the eggs of birds have a different kind of shell, okay? It's a harder, more brittle shell made of calcium. And it is also permeable to gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Hello? Hi. Yes. You're welcome. So um, it's permeable, oxygen can diffuse in and out, carbon dioxide can diffuse out. Nicholas? Okay. It's not so what we call blood is a mixture. It's a mixture of liquid called plasma, of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So they're all mixed together. It just looks to us like a plasma is a thing in the bag that they hook up to you yeah. No, that's not. I mean, it could be. You could get a transfusion of plasma, but generally that's just a, a glucose solution. Yeah. 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 So, bird eggs generally, after um, being um, laid by the female, have to be incubated. They have to be kept at a proper temperature and moisture level until the embryo inside completes its development. And then it breaks out of the shell and hatches. And even at first, after those eggs hatch in the chicks, um, at first they are, they're not independent. Okay? They need um, to be nourished, they need to eat, their feathers need to grow before they can be come out of the nest to be independent. And so generally they will be cared for for a short period of time even food and so forth, until they're able to be uh, independent. Many birds migrate. Why, why do they migrate? So I said, we just talked about, you know, they can live in a cold climate. You know, there's still birds around here. They're not all gone. Um, so why, why is migration common? Nicholas? Yeah, often it's because of a lack of food. Depending on what that bird eats in its diet, well, there's not a whole lot of food around okay, in our area right now. Okay, If you're a, a bird and you generally eat um, insects or invertebrates, well, you're having a tough time right now if you stay in our area. So often birds will migrate to an area where there's a greater food availability. In our area, we say that the birds fly south, which they generally do. It's warmer in the south, and there's areas of more abundant food. That's not always the case. Some birds stick it out. Some don't. And bird migration is pretty interesting. You know, scientists have studied this, and um, for a long time, they weren't exactly sure how birds navigated. Some birds will travel thousands and thousands of miles during their migration. How do they find their way? And they can return right back to where they came from. Um, and so scientists were not really sure if they used the Earth's magnetic fields to migrate or if they visually um, are navigating. And so it's probably a combination. When I was in that ornithology class, they talked about some of the experiments that people did with like homing pigeons, which are in the same place. They would put contact lenses on them so they couldn't see and see if they could make it back to their yeah, home. They would strap magnets all around their head to interfere with their ability to sense the Earth's magnetic field. So they did things like that. Uh, I believe the current thinking is that um, 
much of it is visual. So in the daytime, birds migrating can use sort of the position of the sun. You know the position of the sun and you know the time of day, then you can judge the direction that you're traveling in. Um, at night, birds use um, celestial navigation by the stars, navigating um, by the stars. So they have some pretty complex um, behaviors. Uh, finally, feathers. Um, feathers are unique to birds, and there's various types of feathers. Um, probably the kind you're most familiar with, if you're you know, walking around in the summer and you find a feather on the ground, it's probably a flight feather. You know, it's got a long um, rachis, it's called, a little sort of stem. It's got the feather, the veins of the feather coming off of it. They all kind of hook together, pretty interesting. Um, but those are those, the shape of those flight feathers gives them lift. And the shape of the wing of a bird gives it lift. So as it moves through the air, forms a difference in pressure, which causes lift, allows the bird to fly. But birds have many different types of feathers. Another type of feather that's um, important is used to keep the bird warm for insulation. Do you know what we call these types of feathers? Down, down feathers. So if you have a down jacket, or a down comforter, a down pillow, a down sleeping bag, are filled with feathers, of usually uh, a goose. A goose? And so, did you ever have them come out of like your jacket and poke yeah. you? What do they look like? They don't look like a feather like you find on the ground, right? What do they look like? Little white, all sort of twisty, and what they do is they're, they have that shape and they kind of hook together and they trap little pockets of air. And that's what insulation is, trapping in air that gets warmed up and so that heat can't leak. And so that's insulation, it's a good insulator. Down insulation is very good, it's very compactable. Like if you have a down sleeping bag or something, you could smash it into a very small bag um, and then it still retains its warmth pretty easily. Um, so yeah, those, those feathers are generally close to the body of the bird and they help, help it um, maintain its heat. They're also camouflage. Some types of feathers are used to attract mates. They form the coloration of the bird and so forth. So those feathers um, fulfill a variety of uses. All right, so I told you earlier, birds um, evolved from reptiles, dinosaurs really. And one of the ways we know that is through um, it's also called Archaeopteryx, which is a, a species. And scientists found very, very well preserved examples of Archaeopteryx. It's found in very, very fine sediment, so lots of detail was preserved. And Archaeopteryx, um, the name itself means ancient bird. They like archaeology. And it's about the size of a crow, so mid sized bird. And it showed a very definite link between reptiles and birds. Archaeopteryx had some traits which were reptile-like and other traits which were bird-like. We call this a transitional fossil, sort of showing steps in between. Here's what it really looks like. This is um, that same fossil. And what you see here is this, these darker areas, it's hard to see the detail, but these were the feathers of the bird, and they were well preserved. The scientists could see the actual structure of the feathers. So it had feathers, obviously making it quite bird-like, had a beak. But at the same time, at the end of its wings, it still had claws at the end of its wings. Um, like a reptile has four, four limbs. Um, its tail had a tail made of bone, a bony tail, rather than a tail of just feathers, which birds today have. It had teeth in its beak. Birds today don't have teeth. Reptiles did. So it had sort of these characteristics, some bird-like, some reptile-like. And so this was uh, an important link to help scientists understand. And this is what an artist thinks archaeopteryx may have looked like, something like that. It's got scales covering its head and neck, and feathers, a long tail, and claws up here. 
There's no like right way. It's just the name. It's not a bounty here. It's just a guy. All right. So let's talk about what these parts do. So the shell of the egg. It's made of calcium. Okay. Remember, when we did our osmosis experiment, we dissolved it with a mild acid, vinegar. And that's what happens. Calcium is base, base calcium carbonate, and acid of vinegar is an acid. And so we dissolved that shell. Um, it's made of calcium. And actually, it slowly dissolves as the embryo is growing. The membrane, I mean, the shell of the egg dissolves from the inside, and the calcium that dissolves is actually used to form the bones of the chick. And so that shell gets thinner and thinner as the embryo is growing. The next layer inside, the shell membrane, sort of like a protective barrier to prevent bacteria and things from getting into the egg. Space, that little bubble with the larger one, they act as two things. It's sort of a shock absorber. So if the egg gets jostled around a little bit, it <coughs> helps protect the embryo so it's not damaged. Well, there's also in the fertilizer. Right? The airspace stays even when the egg is fertilized. And also, once if the embryo grows and is almost fully grown inside of the egg, one of the last steps before it hatches, it pokes its beak into this airspace. And that's where it takes its first breath. And also it's where it starts to work its way out of the egg as it hatches. The yolk of an egg, what is that used for? Chloe? Not so much protein, but you're on the right track. Joey? Well, sort of, but we're going to get there in a minute. But it's not the yolk. A lot of people think the whole the yolk, the yellow part, is would have been the chick. Yeah. But that's not. Even if there's a chick, there would still be a yolk. Um, the wood? What? No, it would be the same size. It would get smaller as the embryo grew because it's used for nutrients. It provides the nutrients for the embryo as it grows. It's mainly fats, vitamins, minerals. So you know, if you've ever heard of somebody goes to a restaurant and they order an egg white omelet or something? Mm -hmm. you know why they might do that? Well, because it has so much cholesterol. Yeah, because the yolk contains the fat and cholesterol, and a person maybe is trying to eat healthier. Um, <coughs> an egg white omelet would have less calories than a regular full egg. <coughs> so the yolk is providing energy, nutrients for the embryo as it grows. The yolk membrane just sort of holds the yolk together. Now the other thing is people, somebody last year asked, well, when the chick eats the yolk, it doesn't eat the yolk. It's not like <laughs> the tail bites the yolk the whole time. And somebody said, does it, as the chick eats the yolk, doesn't rupture the yolk membrane. The yolk is actually connected through um, vessels into, directly into the chick. So it just absorbs the nutrients through these vessels, not eating it and digesting it. Um, the chalet, those little rope things that we saw, they're made of protein. And they basically keep the yolk suspended, keep it in the middle of the egg. Why do you want to move? Because otherwise when the egg moves around, like it would, fall, it would drop to the bottom, then it rolls the other way, and it just sort of in there. So it keeps it in the right spot of the egg. The albumin, the egg white, is mostly protein. And the embryo uses that protein to make its body, make its tissues. Finally, that little spot on the yolk, this little white spot if you look carefully, the blastoderm, that's actually the part of the egg that if it had been fertilized, would grow into the actual chick. That's where the sperm would enter to fertilize the egg cell. And then it would grow and get larger from two cells to four cells to eight, 16, 32, and so forth. 
So that last of their maxwell would have been the chip if it had been fertilized. Scary? Yeah, yeah no, we need it. It's not fertilized though, so.